one of the most amazing places on Earth is Yellowstone National Park. With beautiful mineral pools and hot geysers, this place is full of mystery. Early trappers thought that this was the entrance to hell itself and came back with unbelievable stories of this amazing landscape. More explorers came and it was so impressive that a movement began to save this national treasure for the people. And in 1872, it became America's first national park. Most of the signs in the park approach its history from an evolutionary perspective, meaning millions of years and based on the religion of secular humanism. But a closer look at the evidence reveals consistencies with short ages and large catastrophes. The biblical record best explains what we see at Yellowstone. All this and more, next on Awesome Science. Awesome Science takes you on a field trip to some of the most amazing geologic and historical sites around the world, where we use the Bible as our history guidebook to interpret what we see, that the Bible can be trusted, and empirical science falls in line with the biblical account of creation, the fall, and the flood. Science, it's awesome. When you think of Yellowstone National Park, most people usually remember the geysers and mud pots, but there's so much more to see. It covers over two million acres and three states cross its boundaries. Yellowstone contains one of the world's largest supervolcanoes. The last of the three gigantic eruptions was hundreds of times greater than that of Mount St. Helens, and the first eruption was thought to have been two thousand times that of Mount St. Helens. The Bible tells us that at the beginning of the worldwide flood, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. During the flood and right after, the earth was going through tremendous geologic changes because of the moving of earth's outer plates. Volcanoes were still active, including this caldera, shaping the land after the flood. We can see other supervolcanoes around the world. They can be seen on almost every continent. Ones we know of reside in California, New Mexico, Indonesia, New Zealand, and Japan. The park has two main access routes, a south circle and a north circle, each passed by rather interesting features. Besides the sedimentary and basement rocks, there are two other types of rocks in the park. Volcanic rhyolite, which is hardened lava, and tuft, which is cemented volcanic ash. After passing the park entrances, you'll eventually come into the Yellowstone Caldera. It has been filled mostly with volcanic tuft. Much of the rim has been breached or covered with volcanic products. Remember, this is an active volcano with a lava chamber just several miles beneath the surface. There is no immediate danger, but it is a reminder of the volcanic activity that we've seen from the past and activity that we expect in the future. Throughout the park, there is evidence of the Yellowstone Fire, which happened in the summer of 1988. It burned almost a third of all the trees in the park. Many of the larger animals were able to escape and return later. Because of our creator's design, even in a sin-cursed world, the forest is coming back quickly. In order for us to better understand the geology at Yellowstone, we need to take a look at the geologic column. The traditional belief from secular scientists is that the geologic column represents long ages of time, billions of years, starting with the Precambrian and ending in the Cenozoic being laid down slowly and gradually without a global catastrophe. This sequence is never complete in any one location. So secular scientists have to combine locations to get their full view of the column. 
Using the Bible as our history guidebook, the Earth is only about 6,000 years in age, according to the genealogies. Since many of the layers are sedimentary, the flood was the catastrophic historical event that was the mechanism for quickly laying down each layer. The fossils we find in each layer were mostly buried over the year of the flood. Many Precambrian rocks are those created during the week of creation, mostly on day three. There were likely forces acting upon them during the flood with the raising and lowering of the mountains and valleys to cause some changes, but largely they were the rocks made during creation week. Since there were about 1600 years before the flood, we do see some evidence of erosion and some sediment layers, but there are very few fossils because the flood, the prime mechanism for fossilization, had not yet come. Secular scientists say that these early layers do not have fossils because life was too simple at the beginning. And only microbes had evolved. But the biblical explanation is much stronger for several reasons. First of all, these simple life forms are not simple at all. And further, the conditions necessary for fossilization didn't occur until the flood came. The Paleozoic layers start with fossils of seafloor creatures, which would have been buried first with the onset of the flood. This makes sense because the flood started with the fountains of the Great Deep breaking open. In layers above are fish fossils because they were the next to die. We then find land plant fossils and coal. When the flood moved inland, it wiped out most of the vegetation. Land animals would have escaped to higher ground, or by virtue of being on higher ground, would have had a higher burial in the fossil layers. The Mesozoic rock layers contains more coal and reptiles. As the trees were uprooted, they surely formed into some of the large floating log mats, similar to what we have seen at Mount St. Helens Spirit Lake after the eruption. When the loosened logs rubbed together, floating on top of the floodwaters, their bark came off and sank to the bottom of the seafloor, causing large deposits of peat, which eventually turned into coal when buried by other sediments. Large reptiles could no longer survive. Their bodies may have floated on top of the water for a while, but eventually their weight and mass carried them to the ocean floor, where they were quickly buried by other sediments. The natural sorting power of flowing water may have also contributed to distributing plants and animals in sedimentary layers through buoyancy and other factors. Fossilization of plants and animals happens quickly. It does not take long periods of time. We don't find any dead carcasses on the seafloor today. Dead animals on the ocean floor are quickly consumed by scavengers and their bones decay away. The same is true on land. It is suspected that mammals survived the longest. Many of them could have survived a bit longer on higher ground or on the floating log mats. Many mammals also float when dead, preventing them from being rapidly buried by sediment and fossilized. The Cenozoic contains the last layers, which may have marked the end stages of the flood and the short time thereafter when there were continuing local catastrophes. Most layers have a better explanation when viewed in the light of a biblical worldview. Since there is not a full sequence of the column in any one location, this is consistent with the flood account because water and currents will carry sand, silt, and mud to different places around the earth. It's flood action, not billions of years. On the northwest side of the southern loop, is a prized collection of geysers. It's a great place to get out and tour the hot springs. Yellowstone hosts two thirds of all the known geysers in the world. The close proximity of these geysers is because of the large magma chamber a few miles below the surface. The highest geyser in the world resides here, Steamboat Geyser. It can erupt up to 300 feet high, but eruptions are rare and unpredictable. A geyser's source is melted snow and rain, which eventually moves through the porous volcanic rock. The water mixes with saline brine and heat from the shallow magma. 
The water rises well above the boiling point, but remains in a liquid state due to the pressure and weight of overlying water and rocks. The water can exceed 400 degrees. The silica in the water creates seals in the fissures and a plumbing system develops. When the pressure is sufficient, it forces the water up to the surface and a geyser results. There are a variety of minerals and species of algae in the hot pools. Microbes grow at different acidities. A pool's color can be used to determine its acidity. Green is more acidic and orange is more alkaline. The organisms and enzymes can survive sulfur emissions similar to microbes living near thermal vents on the bottom of the ocean. Secular scientists suggest that if you look into the hot pools, you can imagine life as it began billions of years ago. In reality, these heat-loving microbes are not simple or primitive, but extremely complex in their structure and biochemistry. They require an intelligent designer, the creator god of the universe. Evolved over billions of years? Not a chance. Some of the hottest geothermal features here in Yellowstone are thermals. Behind me here is Roaring Mountain. Any water that comes up close to the surface immediately gets flashed into steam. The Yellowstone River runs through the park with its source from Yellowstone Lake. The river has cut through volcanic rhyolite and soft tuft, leaving a stained pastel color by the hot springs and fermarols. The river cuts through Hayden Valley, where many buffalo roam. There were once millions of buffalo that roamed the plains and mountains of North America. They were killed off mostly by hunting, but now a strong herd exists in Yellowstone year-round. Hayden Valley is thought to have been covered up by 200 feet of water when Yellowstone Lake extended through this valley after the retreat of the glaciers at the end of the Ice Age. Very little grows here because it was a lake bed where glacial clay lines the valley floor. Trees across the river mark the former shoreline of the lake. This area in the park is called the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. It was cut by the Yellowstone River through basalt and ash and is one of the most well-recognized geologic features of the park. Secular geologists thought that the carving of this canyon took tens of thousands of years, but evidence is beginning to emerge that an upstream ice dam may have failed. Carving out this canyon in a very short time, maybe even as little as a day, the rock in the canyon is soft, so it would have been quite easily cut by fast-moving water. There is similar evidence like this in eastern Washington with the Missoula Flood, at Mount St. Helens, as well as the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The steepness of the canyon walls help us realize that there has been a recent cutting of the canyon. Based on the current rate of erosion, long periods of time would have eroded the canyon much more than it is now, and the canyon walls would have been much more gradual in their slope. We know that this is not formed by glaciation because it does not exhibit U-shaped features like Yosemite National Park. A large glacier, as it moves and cuts the valley underneath it, will shape the valley with rounded corners at the bottom. When the ice retreats, the valley has a U-shaped bottom. A valley cut by a river tends to have a V-shaped valley with steep sides. Understanding that this canyon has not been affected by glaciation helps us conclude that it was formed quite recently, after the Ice Age, only a few thousand years ago. Throughout the park, there are some really cool mud pots and they are some of the most acidic features in the park. In 1870, Mud Volcano was a miniature volcano. It spewed mud up to 50 feet in the air. Early explorers were awed by it. Hydrogen sulfide gas from deep in the earth is used by some microorganisms as an energy source. They help convert the gas into sulfuric acid which breaks down rock into wet clay and mud. 
escaping gases explode through the mud. At over 7,000 feet, Yellowstone Lake is the biggest and highest lake in North America. Some people are concerned because a bulge has been seen growing on the bottom of the lake. Some say it's going to erupt soon. We shall see. It's true. Scientists have been closely monitoring Yellowstone Lake for volcanic activity and a growing bulge on the bottom of the lake. In a study of past eruptions around the world, a bulge in a volcano can be bad news. Right before Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, the entire north side of the mountain grew out in a large bulge. Then, the entire north side slid into the valley below, and a nine-hour eruption ensued. Let's face it, the Yellowstone caldera is not just dormant, it's active, but very placid at the moment. If the area were to become active in a big way, based on what we can infer from eruptions in the past, the effects could be devastating to the entire west coast. This type of mega volcanism is a remnant of the catastrophe recorded in Genesis chapter six through eight, where the fountains of the great deep opened up, which included water and magma. We don't see it like that today, because the earth after the flood began to equalize and the large-scale volcanic activity slowed down. But during that time, it was catastrophic. Will the Yellowstone supervolcano erupt again? Let's read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to find out. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. One of the most famous geysers in the park is Old Faithful, which erupts around every 95 minutes, faithfully. Two large earthquakes in the park, one in 1959 and the other in 1983, have offset how regular Old Faithful has become. The area around Old Faithful is a great place to view several beautiful pools and geysers. On the northern loop in the northwestern corner, there is an amazing sight. Hundreds of feet of white terraces have been built up. How did they form? During the time of the global flood, around 4,350 years ago, large deposits of lime mud accumulated and were deposited in this area as limestone layers. Today, winter snows and summer rains bring much water to the area. As it moves through the ground and as it is heated, it dissolves and picks up the lime and brings it out of the ground through fractures in the calcium carbonate beds. As the water flows across the surface, it evaporates and the elements are left to form terraces. These terraces are always in a transitional state. Old ones stop forming while new ones begin. This is because the chemicals in the water frequently plug up the outgoing water, forcing it in a different direction where there is less resistance. Some signs in the park suggest that Mammoth Hot Springs took 65,000 years to form. But at the current rate of deposition, averaging about eight inches a year, only a few thousand years would be required to make the terraces we see today. One of the most fascinating parts about Yellowstone is its petrified forests. Much of it is in the Specimen Ridge area. There we find hundreds of upright petrified logs in 27 to 50 layers of forests. Secular scientists say that there were many forests here, one laid on top of the other, which took around 30,000 years in an ongoing cycle to create. A forest would grow then it would be covered by volcanic ash. Minerals would soak into the tree and petrify it. The ash weathered into clay and soil. Then a new forest grew, was destroyed by the ash, and the process continues. Eventually, the layers were exposed by erosion, revealing what we see today. Using the Bible as our history guidebook, 
with an Earth age of only 6,000 years. The petrified forests of Yellowstone do not match up with the secular science of 30,000 years. No surprise. But there is a different explanation. The Bible says there was a catastrophic event, the Genesis Flood, which destroyed all vegetation on the pre-flood Earth. Some of the trees survived on top of the floodwaters, creating these giant tree mats. Yet, even by the end of the flood, some of the trees were still floating on top of the floodwaters, even as the waters retreated from off the new emerging land masses. As the logs had become waterlogged, the heavy end, the root ball, sank in the water to the submerged land surface below. With the water current still carrying the logs, they were buried rapidly in the accumulating silt. There was also a lot of continuing volcanic activity beneath the waters and on the emerging land surface, creating large explosions of ash that added to the accumulating silt. Because the logs were not sinking at the same time, they would come to rest on different layers of silt and ash. Eventually, the upright logs would be fully buried and the chemicals in the water and ash would petrify the trees quickly. When the floodwaters fully receded, up to 50 levels of logs were deposited. This explanation seems like a good story, but hard to believe until you see the facts. If the logs were trees that grew at these locations, one would expect to find a well-developed root system under the logs, but they are non-existent in all of the mature trees at all 50 layers. Also, none of the logs have branches or bark, indicating a cataclysmic event. In addition, the root balls at the bottoms of the logs are small and broken off. Evidence of the trees being forcefully pulled out of the ground, transported, and deposited here in this area at Yellowstone. When studying the rings of logs near the top of the ridge and at the bottom, there's a lot of similarity in the ring sizes, indicating they all grew at the same time. If the trees grew in different forests at different time periods, the rings should not be similar. If each forest was killed by a different eruption, then the trace element profiles in the ash the logs were buried in should be different, even if from the same volcano. But there are only four different trace element profiles, which help us realize that the trees were buried in less than a year. In a typical forest, the decomposing material on the forest floor, such as pine needles and dead trees, should match the trees around us. But at Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone, the petrified flora doesn't match the petrified trees. Which makes for a very petrifying situation. Which indicates they didn't grow there. In a typical forest, you would expect to find evidence of animal life, such as burrows and nests. But there is no evidence of animal tracks in this area, except the remains of termites and their holes in some of the logs. Some say that the animals fled during the eruptions. This happens with large animals, but is not true of worms and insects. And bones, teeth, and droppings couldn't escape burial either. If the secular story is used to explain the formation of these petrified forests, then there should be successive layers of clay and organic debris. But there is no clay found in these volcanic layers and the organic materials are only about an inch thick in places. In addition, sediments in these layers appear to have been graded and laminated, the result of water and fluid action. If these layers were only produced by volcanic activity, no such features should be evident. This was the result of the receding floodwaters, 
not just volcanic action. Where else have we seen this type of process in action? In 1980, during the eruption of Mount St. Helens, the entire north side of the mountain slid into the valley. Part of the landslide went into Spirit Lake, causing a massive water wave 800 feet high. The water wave and the steam blast reached the opposite hillside where a very large mature forest stood. In very short time, all of the trees were uprooted and pulled down into the lake. 30 years later, some of the logs still float on top of the lake. Several months after the eruption, some of the logs began to float upright, then slowly sank to the bottom of the lake upright. The ones with less resin sank first. Using sonar equipment, scuba gear, and general observation, it was estimated that around 20,000 logs were upright on the bottom of the lake at different levels in the sediments. Why? Because ash from the blast zone is constantly being washed away with silt and debris into the lake, the trees will eventually be covered over. If another eruption happens at Mount St. Helens and a large mud flow empties into the lake, then more logs will be buried at a more rapid rate. If the lake was drained at any point in the future and the layers exposed, the buried logs would probably look much like Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone. Mount St. Helens has also explained petrified forests around other parts of the world, such as in Argentina, where Darwin proposed long geologic ages. This evidence shows how short catastrophic events could explain the same geologic features from a biblical perspective. Pretty awesome. Petrification is actually a pretty simple process. It doesn't take that much time. Secular scientists used to say that it took many years to petrify wood, but we can do it quickly in labs today. What you need to petrify is the presence of water saturated with minerals such as lime or silica. We know from the springs around Yellowstone that these minerals are in abundance. When a log is buried and saturated with water containing these minerals, there is a chemical exchange that takes place. Researchers a few years ago did their own experiment by putting a piece of wood in a silica-rich hot spring at Yellowstone. One year later, the wood contained substantial petrification. Even if we give an extended range, it could take as much as 100 years to fully petrify a log. That's still within the biblical time scale. In fact, commercial hardwood is now being produced for flooring, which is man-made petrified wood. Many of the processes in nature that secular scientists thought took ages, we can now do it very quickly. Coal and oil have been produced in less than a year. The global flood would provide the right conditions to quickly bury and exchange the chemicals and the heat necessary to produce petrified wood on such a grand scale as here in Yellowstone. Yellowstone National Park, where many natural wonders are remarkably preserved, also preserves a testament to the catastrophic Genesis flood and its after effects. Secular and biblical geologists both agree on the evidence that we find here in Yellowstone, but we disagree on how we interpret that evidence. One rejects God and the Bible, and hence a global flood, and accepts millions of years from the religion of humanism. The other views God as the authority in all areas, and hence recognizes the effects of the flood as a result of God's judgment on sin. God is going to judge the world again, this time by fire. We are all given the opportunity to turn to our Creator, repent of our sins, and make Him our Lord. We invite you to begin this journey today.